in our passage this morning, it mentions the first book, which is the Gospel of Luke. Both are written as letters to a person named Theophilus. We just walked recently through the last chapters of Luke during Jesus' last days, his death and resurrection. Now, 40 days later, we stand with the disciples at the ascension. Now, for those who keep a close count on your 40 days after Easter, Ascension Day was technically Thursday. But I don't think God will mind if we celebrate and ponder its significance today. Hear now the word of the Lord from the beginning of the book of Acts. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven... Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that the risen Christ is in our midst, that you have a message for us today. I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, that we might come to know you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Three-year-olds do not like to wait. They are some of the most impatient of our mostly impatient species. I happen to live with one of these now-centered ur urchins, these now-centered urchins, I like to call them. On a Friday, I had just stood up from reading this passage, went into the kitchen where this three-year-old urchin often resides, and she immediately asked me, Mommy, is that a popsicle? Pointing to the popsicles that we had made out of leftover communion juice. Do you not all have communion popsicles in your freezer? Probably that is a unique experience of a pastor's kid, and we're already working on the therapy fund. So she says at 8.30 in the morning, can I have a popsicle? No, I said, why don't you wait until this afternoon? It's supposed to be nice outside. No, I want it now, 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 now. These urchins are prone to repeat themselves. They're also inclined to jumping up and down in tears of fits until they get their way. But fortunately, we avoided the tantrum this time. Three-year-olds are not so different than we are. A friend of mine, a grown friend, was working in New York City, and she decided to go to business school in California. As you might imagine, the pace of life is a little bit different in the Bay Area than it is in Manhattan. Now, Jennifer is of the type A variety who is perfectly suited for business school and not necessarily suited for laid-back California dreaming. So she gets out there and realizes that she is agitated most of the time. So she starts to pay attention carefully. She's standing in the line at a grocery store, and in her experience of life, people are ready with their money when the cashier tells them how much it will be. But the person in front of her pulls out the checkbook and begins to write the entire check 
after the groceries have already been scanned. And Jennifer loses her mind. Now, I would like to say that after this experience, she realized her impatience and slowly worked on her attitude. But instead, after she finished business school, she hightailed it back to the east where she still gets annoyed at people who are not ready to pay when it's time. I try to tell her there's more to an encounter with a cashier than paying money promptly, but she doesn't care. We all have our ways of being impatient. We expect downloads instantaneously, our shipping express, our food fast, and our movies on demand. Even if you are more patient than most, my guess is that you have had to work harder at this to be patient in our increasingly fast-paced world. Popsicles, checkout lines, and technology are nothing compared to life's hardest waits. Waiting for the grief to stop piercing, waiting for the depression to ease, waiting for the violence to end. We have waiting to do in this life, and it's not pretty, and it's not enjoyable, though I can't imagine how painful life would be without the presence and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Today, being Mother's Day, involves waiting also. It is supposed to be about waiting to receive or give a gift, to appreciate a mother or to be appreciated. But more often, it involves waiting in the midst of pain for those who have lost a mother or a mother who has lost a child or for one who wanted to be a mother or one who gave up a child for adoption or ended a pregnancy or waiting knowing you are not quite the mother you wanted to be or not quite as supportive to the mother as you had wanted to be. It's good timing this year that Mother's Day falls between Easter and Pentecost as the disciples are waiting for the Holy Spirit, waiting for all that Jesus promised would be true. Though we have the Holy Spirit, we too can join them in their waiting. The disciples are waiting because their Jesus, their teacher, companion, and Lord has been killed He was dead, and now he has been raised and has appeared to them a few times. He's standing back in their midst and says, Wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And that sounds well and good, but they are tired of waiting. Tired of waiting for Jesus' revolution, the one where he will save the Israelites from the oppression of the Roman government, the one where he will rule and all things will be just. No one will be forced to work against their will and all people will have enough food and shelter. The Bible says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has sent by his own authority. Basically, Jesus says, It is going to be a surprise to you, which in itself should not be a surprise. Everything Jesus did was a surprise to them. He ate with sinners, included outcasts. He didn't overthrow Rome. He did get killed. And then he raised from the dead. What isn't surprising when it comes to Jesus? For Jesus, it is always up to the Father, up to the one who created everything, who is Lord of all. Jesus reminds them about the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus is saying, I know you are waiting, and I know it will be painful. But remember the Holy Spirit and rely on her power and allow her to comfort and to hold you. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Woe, vanish, poof, gone, out of their sight. And now, on top of their pain, they are in utter shock. Jesus' ascension is certainly, certainly a mystery, and we will never be able to prove or disprove this. Brian Peterson points out, The cloud is not supposed to be Jesus' heavenly elevator. The cloud is a signal, the sign of the presence of God, as it was with the pillar of cloud in the and at the Exodus, and the cloud at Jesus' transfiguration. 
The point is not that Jesus went up there somewhere. The point is that Jesus went to be with the Father in all power and glory. The point is that Jesus reigns with God and has the ability to send the Holy Spirit to ease our pain and change our paths. The story continues. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? As if to say, Disciples, Jesus is physically gone, but you know his presence. You know his power. You know what he wants you to do. He's been showing you for the last three years. These men in robes redirect the disciples. They are dropped, jawed, mired in their own surprise and uncertainty, and the men in robes draw their attention back to earth, back to where they are supposed to serve. If the story of the ascension does anything for us this morning, I hope that it will both show us the waiting is necessary and also redirect us from our own pain towards serving others. And this is not something that we do on our own. Next Sunday, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Unlike the disciples, we do not have to wait for the Spirit to come, for she is here, not only carrying us through, but pointing the way. Commentator Frank Crouch points out the hope we have. Hear this quote. Because Jesus has life, we have life. No matter how relentlessly the world seeks to lead us astray or frighten us with the threat of death, or even if Jesus physically departs from the earth, the Holy Spirit keeps alive God's purposes and brings God's life-giving power. If those purposes seem empty or that power seems absent, at times we serve best by waiting. End quote. Serve and wait. Wait and serve. This journey of disciple takes prayerful discernment and willing courage. Often we do need men in robes to remind us to draw our attention back to Jerusalem. As church, we can get distracted by our own internal doings. Not that our study or worship or care of one another is a bad thing, quite the opposite, actually. But we do need to be reminded to focus on Jerusalem, to be called back into Rockford, to be called to serve in our neighborhood. Lest this begin to feel like a chore, let me remind you that when we go out from here, it is not with our own efforts or our own desires, because if so, we would tire easily or not even start. We go out from here into the neighborhood to find Jesus, to search for the risen Christ, to zone in on the work of the Holy Spirit. For God is already making things new. We simply have to latch on for the ride. We may soon have a tangible example of new life in our neighborhood to add to the many examples of new life in our neighborhood. The Valencia Apartments, which has quite a history, I'm coming to understand, even on the National Registry of Historic Places, it's in more of a need of of a makeover than ever. As it sits now, its windows and doors are boarded up, but not tightly enough to keep out squatters and other not-so-safe practices. It sounds like, from people who have been inside, it's pretty trashed in there. Even the one building that was rehabbed six years ago is not so great. If the city and developer put all their ducks in a row, the buildings could once again be a draw for folks who want to live and work in the same proximity. It could be a place of hope and new life. It could be an anchor of our transitional neighborhood. But, as many of you know, only time will tell if this is going to be for us a sign of new life or another test of our patience. This morning, whether you are waiting for a popsicle or something more significant, know that the Holy Spirit is about to rain down in your life. The Holy Spirit is perhaps more surprising than Jesus. So we don't know whether you will be comforted in your waiting or whether new life will burst 
burst forth in front of your eyes. Whatever the case may be, let us draw together as church, support one another, and redirect our eyes toward the city, toward Jerusalem and beyond, toward Rockford and beyond. For God is a God of justice and might, glory and peace, and our life is in his hands. Alleluia. Amen.